I am an emergency medicine doctor. I work at an academic medical center, the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a faculty member. I have clinical responsibilities and then I also teach. And then I do a lot of immigrant health uh, on the side, which I use a lot of my skill sets from the emergency department to uh, run Puentes de Salud. In the emergency medicine side of it, oh, what don't I enjoy? I mean, it's a great job. It's very broad, it's very general. It's very fast paced and it is a unique place because where, where we sit, we don't screen people based on socioeconomics. We don't screen people based on their insurance status or who they are, their immigrations. We see everybody. So it's a really unique view of the real world. When you see the realities of healthcare in this country and access to care issues and health disparities, in the emergency department, you see it live. It's like Canterbury Tales. You know, you're traveling down the road and you meet the miller, you meet the, the nun, and you exchange and there's this, this unique personal exchange that in a way enriches you. You see the successes and you see the failures. That's a neat place to be because it humbles you. When I got to Haverford and, you know, as a liberal arts college, you take art history, you take philosophy, that was a game changer because now I had to shift the way I thought about things. What helped me the most at Haverford was the art department. So I was an art major. Really? I was a painter. In painting, when you're looking at something on fast, like a still life, and you're looking at it in light and darks and pools and warms and creating the composition, it's two-dimensional, it's very flat. But in your mind, if you're able to rotate around an object, and understand that there's a volume there and that naturally light is going to hit that and have an effect. Well, the way you understand that is by rotating around it in three dimensions. So you look at a problem, not just from the front, from the side, from the back, from above, from below. When you look at a patient with nuance of diabetes, you're not just looking at them from the front, right? If you do, you're looking at them in a clear clinical doctor writing a prescription problem. But if you start to turn it, so to look at them from all different angles, you start to dissect the problem and understand it more. I, I mean, that's the way I look at it as an artist. Uh, and that comes from painting. And so I try to teach that to students, you know, how to look at a problem from a different perspective. Instead of just straight on as, oh, this is a diabetic, we're going to implement this oral agent and we'll recheck him in three months. You start to look at it, well, you know, you immigrated here from Mexico where you lived in the highlands uh, as a subsistence farmer with a very lean diet, low protein, low carbs, low fat. Uh, and now you moved here and you've taken up a job in a pizza parlor where you have access to strombolis and you've put on 40 pounds. Let's talk about that. Let's go back to how we can lose the 40 pounds or begin to control your diet. You know, see, people say, well, why do you do what you do? You know, you're, 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 you're fighting windmills and it's a sinking ship. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a canvas. It's a blank canvas that I can create maybe a solution. So there was a huge learning curve in arriving at Haverford. I got to college and didn't know what really DNA was. I saw a picture of it once or twice in Time magazine. <laughs> and here people had classes where they'd broken it down molecularly. And I was like, really? You know, I, I mean, it was just a total different. It was like going, you know, like in the Matrix from slow motion to sudden moving through something so fast. It was like your head spun, you know. It was painful. <laughs> you survive, you know, you, you fight, you, you fight back and you, know, you knuckle down, you, you figure out strategies for, you know, keeping pace. It was hard. You know, there's this notion of tolerance, of, of exchange of values, and I keep that with me. You know, every day I go into a patient's room in the ED, you know, at one point it could be the executive vice president of a co corporation, but it could also be a homeless guy. Each person has values and stories and, you know, there's an opportunity to listen to that. And I think that's something sitting in, you know, at Haverford in a class or in the dining hall or, you know, on a soccer field or wherever. It was a constant curiosity and a constant exchange of values. You know, I think that where healthcare is moving is towards interdisciplinary approaches 
to wellness and health. And I think that that's the future. Just like with painting, you know, with medicine, there's always more you can do, whether it's multidisciplinary approaches, whether it's going upstream into communities and, you know, working to empower and educate or, you know, building partnerships. For me, that's the canvas. Every time I see a 13-year-old girl who's pregnant or a 15-year-old boy who's shot in the chest, um, I put on my doctor hat and can snap into action, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, trauma, blah, blah, blah. But if that keeps happening, at a certain point, you do a root cause analysis and you say, where's the system failure? Why is this happening? Because if it was in Haverford or Bryn Mawr, that wouldn't be tolerated, and yet it's a part of everyday life here. It's a system failure. It's a failure on my part as a doctor in ways, and the healthcare system in ways, but it's also failure of the community, failure of the education system, failure of the politicians. It, it, there's failure in so many different areas. And so you can keep dumping lots of money in the end result, patching people up, uh, and sending them back out into the environment, or you can look at the environment and say, what can we make, what changes can we implement here that will have lasting impact? The immigrants that I work with, the majority of, it's almost 100% living in poverty. So for me, working again within this relatively small community of immigrants is to build a model that looks at education. And so we, we use a lot of our resources for education purposes and we partnered with some of the public schools. We have about 60 kids in that program who, when they're done at the end of the day, rather than go home to a house where English isn't spoken, where there are low levels of educational attainment in the parents, um, and it's a challenge to get homework done, we sit at the school and we do the homework. And we pair them up with volunteers from Temple, from Penn, from Drexel, from Bryn Mawr, from Haverford, you know, undergrads, to show them the value of how that intersects with healthcare eventually. And so what Puentes does providing care, it becomes also a training ground, a teaching place. I can't say that it's going to, you know, be a hundred percent success, but even if a few kids survive and thrive and prosper, in the long run, they become role models for the community and it builds the foundation for the community's wellness down the road, the next generation, generation after that.